Oh, that's a bad image. Maybe that's how pale I really am. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. It is 1230. That's what it is. 12, 8. PJ. Jacob. Why don't we start with, are there any questions? Uh -oh. Again, open it up. Any questions? PJ, I saw that. Oh, there we go. All right. PJ, what are your questions? Sorry, not trying to rush you. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Sorry, I had to switch my mics because one doesn't work. Um, well, it was mainly for Master Set 11. Um, hold on, let me get it out. Likewise. All right, Master Set 11. 
Um, I believe it was on six C. Yes. Uh, or or I mean, hold on, I am getting very confused by my. I need to check the. Hold on, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, while he's checking something, questions from anyone else. Is there a way that we could um, go over some of the, or you just give us a reminder of what concepts we're going to cover on the test on Monday? Yeah, yeah. All right, so energy, work, that's two chapters there. Uh, momentum, impulse, those go together. So impulse is equal to the change in momentum, which is equal to the average force times time or for the calculus version FDT. And energy and work. We got there's the three work energy relationships. And work total is equal to change in kinetic. And then there's the formulas. I mean, you should know at this point the formula for kinetic energy and potential. We've got several MGH, one half K delta X squared, and negative G M1 M2 over R. And then there's the rotation. rotational motion. So you've got the, the constant ex angular acceleration cake formulas. And then there's the calculus version of it. I mean, the fact that d theta dt or theta dot is equal to omega. So it's sort of some vector stuff into that. Omega dot is equal to alpha. Um, and then there's the, the equations of motion with rotation involved that the fact that torque, total torque is equal to I alpha. So this is total. And then the torque of an individual from an individual force is equal to R cross F. And, and what is the alpha? Angular acceleration. Okay. And and whenever you're trying to find uh, total total torque, are you able to find both of the individual torques and just add them together? Or do I remember that wrong? Nope, nope. You can do that as well. And there are a lot of problems where you you do that. Okay, I just want to, I just want to make sure. Oh, then uh, you got the harmonic motion. Vibrations and waves. And harmonic motion depends upon that the force is equal to the negative K 
displacement from equilibrium. And then that's when you get into, you know, the slew of formulas that there's a formula, the angular frequency is equal to the spring constant divided by the mass period is equal to two pi times the square root of mass over the spring constant. Uh, Omega is equal to two pi times the frequency. Frequency is equal to one over the period. And then there's the standing waves. So from a flow point of view, we started out with basic concepts of uh, Newton's laws, and just trying to define motion. These two chapters are these four chapters here of energy through momentum are looking at the exact same thing, use, starting with the principles of Newton's laws and just sort of expanding it. There's different ways of attacking the exact same problems. And then we started adding a little reality, a little more reality, once we've gotten through the sort of the techniques that rotational motion is we're now we don't have to tie ourselves to just linear motion. We can now do rotational motion and harmonic motion. So I guess I should, for completeness, this would be linear motion up there. Uh, and that basically sums it up. Sorry, I might have worded that question wrong, but um, for the multiple choice test on Monday. Oh. oh, yes. Sorry about that. The test on Monday is the multiple choice test is this stuff right here. Newton's laws and linear motion. So the stuff from tests 1A and 1B. And could you explain what you meant by, like, if we improved on the test, what would happen? I kind of caught the end of that a couple of days oh. ago. Yeah, it's just that there's a, for improvement, I give a bonus quiz grade of an A for most improved. That, that's all that is. So just one student gets that? Uh, typically, for a class of 11, four students will get it. Okay. All right. Thanks. It's a, in my mind, an acknowledgement of, of the effort made by the student. I was thinking if everybody got all 30 right across the board, everyone get perfect scores, then no, I still give the bonus grades, but it probably won't make much difference because everyone just got an A plus on the test. And I, another question regarding like uh, 100 quiz grades and stuff. I remember in the syllabus, you mentioned something about like, I don't know if it was an attendance grade or participation that would be like two quiz grades. Is that right? There are two class participation grades. Okay. There's, not, there's not an attendance grade, but there's two class participation grades. So, I mean, if you skip all the classes, then your class participation is non-existent. Right. Okay. I just, I thought I remembered that, but I just want to make sure. Yeah, so it's if you sit there and don't say anything, that's a C for class participation. Okay. If you detract from the class, it lowers, and if you participate in the class, it goes up, and it's based upon gut feeling. So there's no real clear way to define who would have like an A or something for class participation. No, not really. I mean, this is ultimately it comes down to is the class better off for you being in there with the class notice if you weren't there. That's a cruel way to word it. That was worded badly. That is pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> but I, I guess I hope everyone would know if I was gone. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, we would. 
it's it's sort of like uh, if the person were not there, how would the class have been different? And so that that's sort of the participation. I mean, is does the person help move the class along? Does the person attempt to answer questions? The person just dutifully just take notes and not say anything. I mean that. So in that respect, the notice if you're there or not is probably really bad wording. Because I was, if, about, I was if, about to say, if the person died, do we do we throw a party or do we do we mourn? Do we even uh, notice if yeah. they died? Which reminds me of a student years ago when I was teaching high school, exuded so little energy. I looked at him one day, looking right at him, and I marked him absent. I'm not going to share his name with you, but I still remember his name. What? How could you, you do that? Didn't care? I did recognize as soon as I marked him absent that I shouldn't have, at least. Oh, I thought it was intentional. No, no, it was just they. He was uh, a low energy kid. I guess he was probably 16 at the time. Anyway. Uh, other questions? I know PJ was looking some stuff up, but while we're on the more administrative aspects of it, other questions on the administrative aspects? How much do tests account for a grade? Depends. Either 40% or 60%. What does it depend on? All right, so I'm going to... Any questions on what I have written on the screen here before I clear it? All right, so let's go through the convoluted way that I do this. All right, so there's three basic types of grades. There's quiz, there's test, and there's lab. So let's say you have a 2.0 on quiz grade, you have a 1.7 on a test grade, and a 3.0 on your lab grade. Test count twice. And then I take the middle of these three grades, which is a two, and I count that, whatever the middle one is. And then I average those five numbers together. So tests are, so quizzes will be either 20% or 40%, labs are 20% or 40%, and tests are 40% or 60%. So if you drop anything? Say it again? Do you drop anything? No, because it ultimately doesn't really make any difference. The The way I do grading, ultimately, there's not a lot of subtlety there. Um, or it's shockproof. So a single grade typically does not have major impact. It's, it's set up so that if you're having a bad day, your entire semester is not ruined. OK, thank you. Yep. So if you got like uh like a 2.5 on tests instead that would count three times yes it would and okay. that's that's what it would be worth 60 percent oh that makes sense what is a master set con uh considered quiz so if we were doing so in uh, the full in class 16 weeks then we would have had the master sets plus we would have had in class quizzes and so, I mean, there would have been like 15 or 16 quiz grades. It's so, so, so no matter what, so no matter what, the test grade counts twice. And if it, if you have higher than the other grades on the test, then it counts three times. Do I understand that right? If whatever the middle one is. So if the. Oh, oh, OK. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Excuse things to the middle. And then the other piece of it. So technically, an A is a 3.5 to a 4. A B is a 2.5 to a just below 3.5. I think this, this is what I have in my syllabus. And then so it's a A, B, C, 1.5 to just below 2.5, and so on. But I mean, the, sometimes grades are dependent upon my concentration at that moment. I mean, there's a well, one, I've got, and what's, if I had to sum it up 
briefly would be a 20 point gradient scale instead of a 10 point scale because one you're learning the process this is for quizzes and labs you're learning the process and also it's to offset any personal bias there might be in there not bias against the student but you know if my wife is mad at me because i didn't get her a present for her birthday tomorrow then if i un subconsciously take it out on something i'm grading i don't want that to have an effect so uh that's one reason for the sort of lenient gradient scale up till there and then if you got a 3.49 i mean you are so darn close and I might treat it differently if there are pluses and minuses, but really, is there significant difference between a 3.50 and a 3.49? Well, that difference could be me and, and not you. So this is the point really when I go into, is the class better for that person being in there? Well, 3.49, unless you really piss me off and no one has in this class, uh 3.49 would be rounded up you know the the is the class better depends upon the at what point do i stop rounding so if somebody has a 3.4 and someone has a 3.41 just so you know i'm not going to if i move that one up to an a that one gets moved also i'm not so ultimately whatever the grade cutoff for a is in actuality, it'll be the same for everybody. What is your uh, late work policy? The written policy is that as soon as I've graded the majority of the ones handed in, then the best you can hope for is an F. Uh, sorry, as soon as I've graded the majority of the ones that have been handed in on time. In reality, I, I'm trying to set it up so I don't get this pile of stuff at the end, and I haven't come up with anything that works for me yet. So in reality, uh, I'm still taking stuff and still grading it. If push comes to shove, if I'm getting to the end and I got to get grades in and I've got a pile of stuff I haven't graded yet, that's the point where I probably would start to enforce it. But I did make a pledge to myself that if it's a matter of whether a student gets a D or a C, then I'm going to grade it. If it's a matter of whether a person gets an A or a B, if I'm pushed for time, then I'm less apt to grade it if it was handed in late. Oh, is that so? Is an F a negative one? No, no. Negative one is you didn't hand it in. F is a zero. Oh, okay. Thank you. So it's, it's still worth handing in stuff if we haven't. Yes done so okay yeah and for labs h is that you did not let's see if you don't do let's say all the majority of the analysis that's an automatic f if you don't do a majority of the analysis and the results that's an automatic you didn't hand it in and if you didn't do automatic uh didn't do a majority of the analysis results or even the data which was written right down in the lab then that is worse than not handing it in so I have a question. What do you consider the majority? Like more than 50, like 50% or? 50% plus something. Okay. So if there's eight questions and you did four of them, but it left the other four blank, you have not done a majority. Okay. So if I did five questions and left three. three. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting it. All right. Yeah. other questions at the moment so when you mean grade late work i mean you'd like you'd put in an actual grade for it or you just you would still give us an f or i'm, I'm not understanding that all right if oh hold on just a second i forgot to warn people i, I have a student who's doing handing a test so i'm going to mute this and uh Answer my knocked door. Be right back.
All right. Uh, the question was around grading late stuff. Of, uh, okay, so in practice, this is not on. This is off the syllabus. Uh, if you want to insist that I stick by what I've written in the syllabus, then you let me know that in the presence of other people, so I have a witness. But if you hand in something late right now, I will still grade it. It is only going to become an issue is if next weekend, when Grades are due Monday at noon. If I've got too much stuff that comes in at the end and I don't have time to grade everything, at that point, it, it's more apt that I'm going to just look at it quickly. Yep, they did it. F. If you, oh, okay. If so, you are borderline between whether you would get transfer credit or not, I will grade it. Okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. So basically just try to get it in just as fast as possible. And accurately. And accurately, obviously, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. So say someone's crunching out a bunch of late assignments, if they turn in like an assignment each night over the course of the next week, they might get graded. Yes. And one per night is much preferable to 15 in, on next Friday. Understood. Thank you. Yep. Could we try to do like 15 this weekend? Would that be better? That would be better than 15 next weekend. Do we have any more labs? No. Sorry. Okay. Oh, All right. You. You're and, awesome. And I know... Chance might be crying tonight, or he might be crying right now and just muted the, the mic. But I'm crying tears of joy. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You just made my day, man. My year. Hey, excellent. I'm glad I could be there for it. PJ hasn't found his master set question. I have a master set question. Okay. Which master set? Master set 10, problem three. All right, I've got. Let me bring it up from over here. All right, so problem. All right, so you said problem three? Yes. Okay, what's the question? On my, uh, like on my submission, I just got like, I guess my idea of impulse is not even close to what the conceptual question was asking for. It was the uh, rubber, rubber bullet, metal bullet problem. Right. Oh, yeah, for other people. Um, so an impulse, I mean, there are certain terms that are used in everyday language, and then there's the physics terminology here. So I don't know if that was part of the issue. Uh, I'm going to clear this. All right. And let's go for a bold color. There we go. Bold or not. That impulse. And uh, I can't, some people are using J and I suspect that's what the textbook uses for it, but uh, it's just the change in momentum or it's force times time. So in this particular problem, 
looking at the change in the momentum is probably the simplest way of doing it. And also, by the way, that I said the greater impulse on the target, uh, really looking at the magnitude there. So, but I've got mass times some initial velocity going this way, and then one of them bounces and one of them stops. Direction matters. We're dealing with vectors here. So if the mass of the two bullets is the same and the, the initial speed is the same, remember this has to stop and then turn around. So this is gonna have to have a bigger impulse because I have a bigger change because it did change directions. I, I don't know if I addressed what your concern was. I think conceptually, I'm still confused um, on how impulse um, is related to, because I thought it was almost like the force exerted on the target in a smaller amount of, in, in that small amount of time was so much larger than the rubber bullet because the rubber bullet just bounced off immediately. If the rubber bullet bounces off immediately, then there's gonna be a much larger force being applied to it. I mean, ultimately force is dpdt. Uh, F equals ma is assumes that mass is constant. And if mass is not constant, the, this is the more generalized form of it. So there is a, so if uh, the change of momentum over time, if time is smaller and it's the same change in momentum, that means the force has to be bigger. But the advantage of dealing with momentum is the fact that we really don't care what happens in the interaction. We just, we're just caring about what happened in the middle, or sorry, happened at the end and happened in the beginning. And just looking at the difference there. But how do you define momentum? Besides mass times velocity? I mean, that's how I, that's how I define it. I, to me, oh, that okay. they are mass times velocity and momentum are synonymous. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Sorry. I was thinking mass times acceleration. I don't know why. All right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, both of the uh, overall momentums for both scenarios, they would be negative. But um, for the first scenario with the rubber bullet, it would be negative 2 mv. And for the scenario with the metal bullet, it would be uh, negative mv. Those would be the those would be the impulses acting on the bullets, and then the impulse acting on the target would be the opposite of that. For the rubber bullet, it would be positive. If the impulse on the bullet was negative two mv, then the impulse that the that bullet exerts on the target is positive two mv. Okay. The rubber bullet. Thank so the answer. So the answer would be the rubber bullet had a greater impulse. Yes. Um, greater. Yes. It exerted a greater impulse on the target. Okay. I think I was thinking of um, value instead of magnitude. In addition to me not uh, using momentum. So, uh, but thank you. This clears it up a lot. All right. Good. All right, so let me uh, touch base with PJ again. PJ, did you find what you're yes, what I you're did. I, have, I have two questions. Okay. Um, for Master Set Eleven, uh, Problem Four. Yes. Um, I had a really hard time, like, thinking through the graphic relationships um, between everything. I didn't know. Like how to answer it at all. All right. So 
you can assume that for each of these collisions, momentum is conserved. So the type of collision it is depends upon the kinetic energy. So I know that unless there's some other energy source that I'm not going to gain kinetic energy. The best I can hope for is that my total kinetic energy beforehand and final are the same. That's what I'm referred to as the perfectly elastic collision. If I end up with more than I started with, so if Ki is less than Kf, that falls into the impossible categories. That, that's flubberesque. What's now, the difference between? Oh, sorry. Yeah, and so the, the, the just just so flubberesque or impossible. The just plain impossible would be things like kinetic uh, negative kinetic energy, which is in one of those. But oh, kinetic energy okay. is one f mv squared. The only way that this could be negative is that if m is negative, or if v is imaginary. I can't remember what the single letter symbol for imaginary is lowercase i i think that is the the base imaginary number oh my mistake i think it's i i think z is integers and i is imaginary but it could be off on that anyway the imaginary and imaginary speeds is definitely not part of classical physics and negative mass is also not part of classical physics is it part of another kind of physics there are some funky definitions out there that where sometimes these things happen. Um, I cannot tell you a specific example of a negative mass. I sus I think there's a theory that deals with if such things happen, but you know, with a lot of theories, it's some physicist needs to publish, so they come up with this ludicrous theory that is most likely complete crap. But there's always that chance that it'll hit and it'll show up in the textbooks and this person will be hailed as a genius. So to my knowledge, they have never found negative mass. And imaginary speeds, I don't know of an example of an imaginary speed. I do know that there are examples in physics, especially in, in electromagnetics, where there are physical meanings to imaginary answers. Uh, so imaginary is really just a bad term for it, but I don't know of a specific case. Oh, no, no. I, I don't know of a case, though. I have not dealt with the case of imaginary speed. And how, what's the difference between imperfect collision and a perfectly inelastic collision? All right, so if they stick together, so we're going to lose kinetic energy. Oops, wrong way. So we start out with more than we end up with and plus stick together. We're going to have the maximum loss in kinetic energy, and this is the perfectly inelastic. If we lose kinetic energy and don't and there's no sticking, that's the imperfect. Oh, okay. Oh, that makes more sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This right here, that's real life. Primarily these two. Like car accidents and stuff? Yeah. Car accidents, uh, sometimes they stick together, sometimes they don't. Hopefully they don't. All the ones I've been in, they have not stuck together, but there's definitely a loss of energy. And that that shows up in the form of the cars heat up some, so the kinetic energy is actually transferred to the more atomic level, as well as the sound. Some of it gets transferred to the air. Sorry, in the real world, how can there be a perfectly elastic uh, collision? And that's why I said primarily those other two. In if you're dealing with particle small enough, then you get perfectly elastic collisions because 
I mean, you're you're dealing with particles smaller than a molecule of air, and so there's no friction either. It's not rubbing against the surface. You're just dealing with tiny particles, smashing them into each other. Oh, so they don't make they don't make heat or uh, or noise or anything. They're just collide. Yep. They they collide, and usually you try to collide them with so much energy that you get the shower of particles coming out. And then with the shower of particles, they most of those are unstable, and so they break up into other particles, and that's how you eventually start collecting whatever particle you need or examining whatever particle you're looking at. I have one more question for Master Set 11. Okay. Oh, were you about to do something first? Nope. Oh, uh, okay. K okay, less than zero, this is just plain impossible. Okay. All right, what's the other question? Um, It's on problem six C. I don't know, I didn't, it was like after they collide, how far does box A go up the ramp? Right. And I was having trouble finding something with this placement in it. Uh, for when you found how fast A was going just before it hit box B, how'd you do that? In other words, the, for part A, what did you do? Um, I found the angle using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, and then I just did, I got one half velocity final squared equals uh, G delta H. Did you so get there from one of the cake formulas or did you get there from conservation of energy? Uh, conservation of energy. Okay. You would do the same thing here, except this time you have the speed at the bottom. So you have, it has kinetic energy at the bottom and possibly it has potential energy at the bottom. And then it goes up. The, the trick on this one, the, the frustrating thing at the end for some students is if you use conservation of energy, you're going to find this distance right here. That would be sort of H final or Depends on where you set equal to zero, but uh, and then the question is asking that distance. So, so you just use the angle. Yeah, just use the angle. Oh, oh wait. So I was. Um. Go ahead, Pants. I'm so sorry. Um, I thought you wanted just like the height up the ramp, as in like height. So the wording of the question is: How far up the ramp will a go? To me, that just smacks of that distance right there is how far up the ramp. Uh, and I, I probably know, first. Sorry about that. I thought I thought it was going to be like horizontal displacement or something. I don't know why. Oh, no. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, the other interpretation of it, of being how far up the ramp is to be this way, uh, I have not accepted that in the past. Um, if you can come up with an example where when someone asked about how far up a ramp or how far up something goes is a reference to vertical and not the actual distance, uh, I will change how I grade that. All right, I'll start my research after All class right. today. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, when you talk about like going up a ladder, don't you consider the distance you go pretty much just from the bottom to the top? Like, if I climb an eight foot ladder, I don't think it's talking about even the, though it's uh, leaning against the wall, so it's technically a triangle still. If you go up an eight foot ladder, 
I mean, you, I mean, that's the eight feet right there. Yeah, I'm, they, using... I'm talking like the A-frame ladders. Is is that eight foot ladder this distance? I thought. That's what I'm asking. I don't. I'm, I genuinely don't know if that's the diagonal or the height. I just always assumed it was the height of the ladder. I, I assumed it was you know when it's folded the height, which would be in essence that distance, the slanted distance. Hmm. But I don't know. All right, so it looks like I have, let me make a note here. All right. Other questions at the moment? All right, I'm going to talk about a couple of things here. Uh, one of which is the problem I was doing at the very end of class and as you know, whenever I feel rushed, I start making more and more mistakes. Uh, I'm gonna use numbers this time, not the numbers from the master set, but I'm gonna use numbers. And in reality, I probably should greatly modify this question. But this is the J makes himself a cylinder. And gets in the chair. So we've talked about, uh, so J a cylinder, which I labeled as J1, this is J a cylinder. And alpha one, how to, how to calculate it. And then J is in a second position and we can find alpha two. So we can find those two. And then, oh, sorry. I'm gonna jump over to master set 11. Uh, I will say that master set 11 problem three C is probably the hardest question on all the master sets. That's pretty cool. So it is, uh, when I came up with the answer, I took me three pages to do it for 3C. So just be aware of that. If, if I get it back a short paragraph, I know it's not sufficient. Sorry, what's that, uh, what's that uh, problem? Master set 11. Problem three C. What is it about? That is the uh, the following one dimensional collisions. Mass of cart B is greater than mass of cart A. And three C is cart B initially traveling in the positive direction, hits cart A initially at rest. Then after an imperfect collision, cart B does not move in the negative direction or cannot move in the negative direction. So the, the, the full explanation took me three pages of writing. It right. seems like a lot. It, Dr. It, Fox. It is a, uh, yeah, it's was more complicated than I initially intended. However, I kept it in there because I mean part of part of the convoluted questions that I throw into master sets, uh, I sometimes think about taking them out. And then I think, well, no, because Sometimes there are convoluted questions on my test, and I want you to at least have some exposure to that aspect of my mind. Uh, there was another question. Somebody just said, Dr. Fox. I cannot find master set 11 on the blackboard. Oh. I don't know if that's just me or if it's like actually there and I just can't see it or what. Uh, I also don't see it, but I downloaded it uh, a couple oh. weeks ago, so I think it just went missing somehow. Yeah, uh, apparently I set the expiration date to be December 6th and not December 16th. Oh. Uh, I have just gone in and changed that. There it is. I apologize for that. Oops. I see it on mine somehow. 
Well, maybe it's just about who you know, not what you know. Some people just have, uh, they know people who know people. It's, it's master chapter 11, master set version four, right? Yes. Okay. I, just, I just made it reavailable. Oh, well, maybe that's what it is. Okay. And apologies for, for that. All right. So back to problem 13 and the mess that's problem 13. All right, so then we got to uh, what is the moment of inertia of the chair? And so I'm just gonna make, make up some numbers here. So in first position, uh, alpha, the angular acceleration, let's just say negative 0.5 and alpha two is negative 0.3. Assuming that when J switches to a new position, uh, he increases his moment of inertia, which reduces the angular acceleration. Now, we have a chair here, sort of overhead view of something that will spin. And there's going to be friction. There's a central point here, and then friction is acting usually not at the very center. So we'll have friction acting backwards at some distance r away. So the torque from friction should be equal to R times F. And I also state that the friction is proportional to the weight of what's the weight of chair plus whatever's on chair. So that means that friction is equal to some constant, this is just a proportionality constant, times the total mass times G. Uh, I'll make up things as I need them. All right. So from the first situation, again, we're going to base this all on T on the to torque is equal to I alpha. Moment of inertia, if you'll recall, eyes don't look like that usually, is the integral of R squared dm, or which is just an infinite sum. You make the masses incredibly tiny, oops, times mass of i, r sub i. You make the masses infinitesimally small, and you get the integral. R so, squared is just, r is the radius, right? The distance from the axis of rotation to where the object is, where that mass is. OK, thank you. Yeah, it's not necessarily the overall radius. So, yeah, because in this example right here, R is the distance from the axis, from the axis of our axis of rotation to where the force is applied. It is not to the edge of the chair. All right, so we have three situations that have been given to us. One is that the J in his first position. So applying this, I have some distance to the friction times the friction is equal to my moment of inertia, which is just IJ1 plus I chair. Uh, that's what I was getting to over, uh, over here is the fact that it's just a sum. So if I have multiple objects, I can just add the individual I's together uh, times alpha one. Alpha one we know, this we calculated in part B. So this was calculated in part B. This was calculated, I think in C. I uh, made up a number of uh, radians per second squared. This is radians per second squared. And ij, uh, let's make sure I don't come up with something too ludicrous. Uh, we'll make this 
IJ1 to kilogram meter squared. I state in the problem that friction is proportional as I have written over here. So this becomes whatever the distance is to where the friction is, which I'll leave just as R. Uh, R times this proportionality constant times mass of J plus mass of chair. times G, and I got the K already, uh, is equal to IJI plus IC alpha one. All right, so that's from J, that's J in position one. J in position two, we know less information about that, but one of the questions is ultimately, what is that moment of inertia? But the left-hand side is still gonna be the same because Jay's mass does not change just because he's in a new position. So this is still RKG MJ plus MC is equal to IJ2 because he's in a different position plus IC times alpha two. And then our third situation is just the chair by itself. So just the chair by itself, and I gave you alpha on that one in the problem. And let's see, I told you negative 0.07. I'm just going to change that to alpha of just the chair by itself is negative 0.1 radians per second squared. And uh, let's make sure that this all holds together. I think it will. And so this would just be R K G mass of chair is equal to the moment of inertia of the chair times alpha chair. That's given, that's what we're trying to find. Mass of chair is given, that, that was 30 kilograms G, 9.8 meters per second squared. We don't know R, we don't know K, and we don't know IC. But I got three equations and in essence, three unknowns. If I treat RK as a single object, as a single unknown, then I've got that unknown there. Matter of fact, we can go for stunning effects. Ooh. So I got that unknown. I've got IC as an unknown and IJ2 is unknown. So again, that's a repeat of the unknown. That's an unknown. So I have three different unknowns. I have three different equations. So this now becomes, unless they are dependent on each other, these three equations are independent and therefore solvable. So let's just go through a solution here. Uh, let's see, I want to, alpha one is negative 0.5 radians per second squared. Alpha two, I said is negative 0.3. Again, these numbers are not the actual answers. These are just ones I've made up. And the other one I made up was alpha C, which I put at negative 0.1 per second squared. Now let's erase some stuff. Uh, before I continue erasing, any questions? Oh, there we go. There was something else that I, J, one, we're just making up of two kilogram meters squared. Now we'll just rewrite those. 
Uh, there's got to be a simpler way of doing this. All right, there we go. All right, hang with it. All right, so we have from the chair situation, again, we have our mass of chair GK is equal to IC alpha C. And again, we know alpha C, we know G, we know MC. Uh, I can lump G in here. So I have RGK is equal to IC alpha C over M, the mass of the chair. From the J in first position. So this was just chair. And then J in the first position, we had RGK mass of chair plus mass of j is equal to ij1 plus ic times alpha rgk we just found over there so we can make that substitution so i have ic alpha c over mc is equal to mc plus mj oh, that should be times equals ij1 plus ic alpha one And at this point, I know alpha C, I know MC, I know alpha one, I know MC and MJ, uh, I know IJ one. I have an equation with a single unknown, IC, and you solve for it. So plug it in numbers. We have I sub C times negative 0.1 over mass of chair, which, I don't think I changed that. Um, over 30 times mass of chair plus mass of J is equal to IJ1, which I said said equal to two. Uh, go ahead and distribute two times alpha one, which is negative 0.5 plus IC times negative 0.5. Uh, what is what is this? Someone be kind enough. Negative 0.316 repeating. 316 repeating? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I got that too. All right. Um, and this is what happens when I make up my own numbers. And 0.5, 0.5. All right, so we're going to end up with a negative moment of inertia here. So, oh well, so much for that plan. Um, but it, the real answer does not have a negative in here, but this is the approach that you take. Once you have IC, the next question is the moment of J in his second position. Well, at that point, You'll know all of these things right here. So you know what RGK is. So you'll have that. Those are the same. You know mass of chair, mass of J. You'll know I of chair at that point, alpha one. Oh, that's J1, wrong one. Oh, then the third equation, which I did not write down this time, would be RGK, mass of chair plus mass of J is equal to IJ2 plus IC times alpha two, there we go. 
and you'll know that you'll know that you'll know everything except for this and solve for it. So that is the approach of that one. And just, I mean, you've seen it before, but for some reason, when I was writing this problem for the first, that test that I put it on, it just seems so incredibly obvious. Any questions? Because I'm about to move on to a different topic. All right, I'm going to clear this. We're going to finish up the Rube Goldberg test and then move on to something very, uh, something similar and different at the same time. All right, so in the last bit of the Rube Goldberg problem, we had the spring here and just mass B is attached. Mass B is oscillating back and forth. And it was expressed by the equation that the position of mass B was equal to one point six oh seven meters, I believe, times the sine of one point six nine oh three radians per second times time. Uh, and there should actually be a negative there. Depends on how you define things. All right. So if this thing's oscillating back and forth, so I've got this point fixed, and this n is vibe, is going back and forth, and that basically is double that is oh sorry that is the amplitude. So from this central position right here, that is 1.607 meters. This is 1.607 meters. The speed of the wave, well, there's more information that was given in the original test that the linear mass density is 0.1 kilograms per meter. The tension is 20 Newtons. So the first question is, what is the speed of the wave? And that involves the equation that we talked about yesterday, tension over linear density. So it's just the square root of 20 over 0.1, 20 Newtons over 0.1 kilogram per meter. And what does that make the speed? I got it. 14.14. All right, units. New in, or sorry, uh, meters per second. Yeah. All right. So this is how fast the the pulse or the, the wave is traveling down the string. Then, and this is a mistake on my part. Uh, I said if the oscillation creates a second harmonic in the rope, what is the wavelength of the wave? Uh, it should be the third harmonic because I have a free end here. This is a free end, and this is fixed. And there are no even harmonics there. So the third harmonic would look like that. So how many waves is that? Wait. Three-fourths. OK, so I got three-fourths of a wavelength right there. I don't know the length yet, so that's going to come in handy in a moment. I know that speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. I know speed. Frequency. Frequency is how often a wave is created. And a wave is created in the time it, in, not the time it takes. If, oh, well, yeah, the wave is created in the time it takes to go back and forth or with the same frequency as moving this back and forth. I know omega right there, it was found previously. So omega is 1.6903 radians per second. How would I find the frequency?
and that's open to divide the divide omega by two pi. Yep. So one point six nine zero three radians per second over two pi radians, and what do we get? I got 2.655 hertz. Wait. Say that again. I got 2.6. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I something on my calculator. It should be less than one. Sorry, 0.269 hertz. So now I can plug that in here. So 14.14 meters per second is equal to 0.269 hertz times the wavelength. So now we can find the wavelength. And what is the wavelength? 52. Point five six uh, meters. All right. So that's how long this is. Uh, sorry, that's how long a wave one wavelength is. And I know that the length of the string is three quarters of that. Because the last question on this test was what was the length of the string? And it's three quarters of the wavelength. So 50, three quarters of 52.56 meters. Thirty nine point four two meters. And that was the end of that test. And then you circle that, you hand it in, and just walk away, skipping and singing, as one usually does. Any questions? Uh, we are a lively group today. Or there's such clear understanding. Awesome. I can make the test even harder. I have a question. Oh, yes. I hope it's not too much of a backtrack, but would you mind explaining when we would use sine versus cosine again? Ah, all right. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff. Uh, all right. So a cosine curve starts at one and then goes like that. So it starts at the amp at the maximum value. It's so that would be cosine, negative cosine starts at the lowest value and goes sine starts at zero and so that's sine and then negative sine goes like that. So if I'm dealing with and first off, you can use either any any of those. But if I have a spring like this, and I have something run into it, so that this is equilibrium right here. If I make an equilibrium equal to zero, uh, the position of equilibrium equal to zero, then using sine makes sense using either one of the two signs. Because if I start my time, if I let time is equal to zero at this point, then time is zero, sine starts me at zero, and I don't have to worry about a phase shift. It pushes on it, and if I make that the positive direction, that means that right after time is equal to zero, it goes positive. So I'll probably use the sine function. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. And just to wrap the other one up is that if instead, suppose I have the mass already attached to the spring and I say, I push the spring and then let go. So I'm starting it at, not at the equilibrium, but I'm starting at its maximum value. If I say that's the positive direction, I'm starting at the maximum positive, I'm gonna use cosine. Okay, thank you. Yep. That was a... 
How long did it take for people to finish that test usually? 30 minutes. 30 no. minutes. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> uh, my record, the first time I, I did, when I did that test, there were a lot of tests handed in with a lot of blanks. Oh, yeah. I can imagine that. <laughs> Did that so, like tell you that it was probably best to not put that test out again? I've tried other variations of it, which have been more successful. But I, I, I keep forgetting about the, the psychological aspect of, you know, a test with parts A through O. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, a number of people just got psyched out. I actually prefer it like that because it's like step by step almost. Yeah, and yeah, I need to somehow. I mean, it's a lot of material, and so there's my inclination of trying to cram everything into it. And I mean, I just need to accept the fact that I need to not test you on something. There, there's the problem of like, you either get through all of the problems or you get stuck on like some really early part and you can't really proceed with any other part of the problem. Which is yeah. why I, yeah, that's like what I run into with that sort of stuff. And if, I mean, let's suppose you get to that situation, you're stuck, you need it for the next part. And I've said before, make up an answer and just keep going. If later on you realize how to do that problem that you got stuck on, you don't have to redo the entire test. Just you know, make a note of here's the correct answer. Here's the number I use for the rest of the test. Okay. Sorry, back to eliminate the phase shift. Um, you're going to treat the cosine or sine graph as like a position versus time graph. That's generally how I start. It depends on the information I'm given. Okay, but that I makes a lot that more one, sense. And then I can take a derivative to find velocity if I need to, and then acceleration. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Is physics 251 much different than oh, this all right. class? Uh, let me talk about 252 for just a moment. The 252, some students find 252 easier than 251. Some students do not. The In terms of the differences, There's no force diagram that's as complex as you get in 251. 252, it's much, you're dealing with fewer objects, so it's usually not as big an issue. The math for 252, uh, if you're doing the, if you're seeing the derivations for a lot of the formulas, then the math is more complex that way. If you don't do the derivations and then it's more of a, hey, here's the situation, here's the formula. And it, I, I, for me, I need to see where that formula is coming from. And so I assume everyone else does too. Uh, so the tangibly with mechanics, the 251, I can see, I can picture a box going down a ramp. I can picture the effects of friction. In 252, I've got a, I have an electric field. I have an electron in an electric field. Now I can come up with a visualization of a point particle in some sort of field, but you know, it's not like I've ever seen a single electron before. And so there's more imagination uh, is required in terms of visualization. So typically the, oh. the grades in 252 are very similar to 
at least for the students I've taught in both, uh, the grades in 252 are very similar usually to what they got in 251. But not always. The, again, I had a student years ago got a D in 251 and got a C in 252. Continuous um, improvement. Yeah, so presumably the, the student got a B the next time they took physics, of course. Do you, do you talk about magnetism in 252? Absolutely. Okay, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah, we start out with there's start out with uh, electrostatics, then electrodynamics, then magnetics, electromagnetics, and then I like to do special relativity and Ms. Sasson doesn't do the relativity stuff. She does, I think she does optics next. It all depends on you know how much time's left at the end of the semester. Do they offer full semester 252? My understanding is that they're going to start offering a full semester version of 251 and 252. Uh, I don't know if it's made it into the spring. And that might start in the fall where they start the full semester version of 251, 252, 151, 152. Uh, so I, I have to check that. Are you teaching 252 next semester? I really can't remember what I'm teaching next semester. It has not been a, it, I haven't needed to know really. But it is getting close to the time where I need to know. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna end with a teaser here, just to keep your minds all a twirl and a buzz. I have a box. It's not a mystery box. I will reveal what's in it in just a moment. I have a box and inside this box, I have a whole bunch of gas particles. These gas, car, gas, gas particles go around and they bounce into the walls and they don't bounce into each other because these are ideal gas particles, but they will bounce into the walls and then bounce off. As the particles bounce into the wall, they will exert a pressure onto the wall. So pressure, which is force over area. And the amount of pressure it exerts is related to the temperature. As for those who've had chemistry, PV equals nRT. And for those who have had sort of physics thermodynamics, uh, PV equals nKBT. This K here is Boltzmann's constant. And it turns out that there is a relationship between the pressure and the kinetic energy. And so where we're heading next, if we have the time, is we are going to relate kinetic energy to the temperature. Is that called thermodynamics? It is indeed an aspect of thermodynamics. Apparently somebody looked and it says that you are teaching 252 next semester. Ah, okay. Ah, there we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, for better or for worse. Are you the best physics instructor? I'm the best one named George Fox. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. I would, do, you like, any, do you like, go ahead. With, with any instructor, I mean, it's, it's, I have been excellent instructors to one student and a horrible instructor to another one in the same class. So it's just how my explanations match with the way your brain is working. So, you know, if I work for you, great. If I don't work for you, I'm sorry. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope you get to get an instructor that fits better for you. I thought you were a pretty good instructor. Oh, I appreciate that. I just, I just like not having to feel out like a new instructor for the first few weeks of a semester. So, yeah, familiar, I familiar, that. familiarity is always good. 
you know, I've had students who have said that they they took in the past uh, they took the 251 course because the guarantee that I'd be teaching 252 or with a guarantee that I'm teaching 252 because they don't want to have to switch teachers midstream. Sorry, Jacob, when you said next semester, is that um, like the fall or the B term of this semester? I assume uh, spring. The spring semester, and I think it's the A term, so January through March. Yeah, it's the A term of spring. And I would just tell you right now that some of the labs actually work. Amazing. Something to look forward to. Oh, uh, there's still labs. There are still labs. Uh, sorry about that, but there are. Yeah, there's still labs. I, I was going to say something else, probably incredibly insightful, but I forgot what it was mid sentence. Um, what time do you think the recording for this for today will be up so that I can go back and review it? Make sure you gather all your friends around to view it at the same time. <laughs> uh, let's see. So by the time I, it'll probably be 2.30 or 3 by the time I can, I will start uploading it. These recordings usually are a lot smaller than the ones I take with the phone. And so I would expect by 3.30 or 4. Okay. If you are in a rush, I can see about oh, no. expediting that. Okay. No, I just was curious so that I would know. Okay. Any other questions? And have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Thanks, you too. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Doctor. Adieu. Thank you. Did not. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, I wasn't super attentive. My my wife's working a twenty four hour shift, so it was just me with the baby. So. Ah. Oh yeah, I hear that. Uh, yeah. Good luck to you. I appreciate. I'll probably have to go back and rewatch some of this. I appreciate it. Thank It'll you. Dream come true. All right. See you. Yeah. See you.